intro to trans. Today we're going to go through tool identification. I'm going to break this video up into two parts uh, because of the length of it. We're going to go through a lot of tools here. Um, for your assignment, you're going to be going through and you are going to be filling in your notes. Your notes are going to have the title of the tool missing and then a couple bits of information. So if you need to, as you're going through, if I'm going too fast, pause the video, look at the slide, um, write down that name. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of those notes or send the PDF back uh, or however is the easiest way for you to do that. And you're going to send that to myself or Mr. Vitag or whoever your instructor is. Maybe we watch this video for a few years now. Um, but I'm excited to go through this because I think understanding the tools is a really important step and getting to know uh, and beginning your journey as a technician or as a tradesman of any kind. So a lot of these tools, until we get some special tools, these are tools you're gonna use in almost any field if you're uh, doing something hands-on. So we're gonna jump right in, uh, go ahead and follow along with me. So first up is we have the pliers family. I know my, my, my picture is taking up some of that real estate up there. Um, maybe I will have to move that. Let's try down here. Maybe that will be better. No, up here, and down the middle. As much as I don't want to cover up the Bronco, I'm going to go down a size and I'm going to come down here. I think maybe that makes the most sense. All right. So first is our slip joint pliers. Now I have examples in front of me. I'm going to kind of hold them up. And I know we're now on this tiny little screen because I was trying to make it as big as possible. Um, but you guys will see some stuff that I'm doing down here. Um, so slip joint pliers. Um, with that, it says up here, general purpose work, hold flat around pieces, cut soft wire. This is like, you think slip joint pliers, you just think pliers. So if you've Probably had someone tell you, hey, go grab pliers. This is like your most basic plier. Uh, so it does have a slip joint, so it can go to two different sizes. I'm gonna try my best to make sure I'm always in the camera here. Um, but you can see I have that size, that's fully closed. And then I can slip it to the other side. And it's only two sizes with slip joints. So you have a, a large and a small setting. Like I said, holds flat around pieces. Those jaws you can see in there, they are shaped to hold different sizes of stuff. You can also just kind of pinch something at the top. So. General pliers, we're gonna call slip joint pliers. All right, on to the next one. Locking pliers, uh, I've got two examples here. Uh, normally the difference with locking pliers is the jaw type, so uh, they're gonna be, you know, these are kind of like your needle nose, and then you just have your, um, your rounded jaws. So here with this, if you've never used one of these, you can release it, just like it. there we go. Um, and then you can adjust with this little toggle screw, can actually adjust the size that's kind of nice right there so you can adjust that and then you're going to lock it back down and the best part is that it holds so if you maybe need to hold something on top of a car or something that you really need that third hand for this actually is a great option for that um, i wouldn't recommend getting bolts off of these that you can fit something else onto uh, but they are really good uh, strip bolts or things that you just you can't get a grip on uh vice grips gonna be really good for that locking pliers is their technical name vice grips was the company that kind of patented it they still actually are a manufacturer of tools, but most people will commonly refer to them as vice grips. So I want to give you guys some of those common names that are in there. All right, next up is channel locks. Channel locks are a lot like slip joint in that it can adjust size, but channel locks have a lot more options. And it's called a channel because in the plier, there's literally a machined channel. Now this one, you can go here, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. It looks like on the back side, I don't know if you can see how well you can see that. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Five different channels in which this can go into. So it gives you a lot of adjustability. So I, I can hold something that big. Well, technically I can hold something that big, uh, but with a lot of uh, good force and clamping force, I can hold something about that big or something all the way down to where it actually touches jaw to jaw. So you can see on here, uh, grooves allow a wide range of adjustability, holds larger objects, uh, and it's longer. So you can actually see here, it's, it's pretty long. Um, so it gives you good leverage. The longer out this handle is, the more leverage you're, you can apply with less force. So the same amount of force with a longer piece gives you more power. So if you got a really stuck bolt or something like that, a lot of leverage helps out. Uh, next up is our needle nose pliers. I'm going to just see here real quick. Probably should have done this a little bit ago. Now that we've got some space, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you guys can really kind of see what I'm working on. All right, not to cut off too much stuff. All right, so uh, needle nose pliers, these are, for me, probably one of the most used uh, pliers because everything on an engine, everything on a car, everything just seems like it's in a tight space. So it allows you to reach objects in those tight spaces, um, really gets the nose in there, and you can get some stuff. Sometimes used to cut and strip wires, um, 
yeah, you can do that in a pinch. That's a, that's a good thing. We put that on there because a lot of times this is a, like electricians use these a lot. You can see down there to bend eyes into the wires for outlets for installation. Uh, but you can strip wires in the little jaws right here. So you can kind of go like that and strip back that insulation. Um, but really, I, I just like them to grab stuff. Um, you can use these for a number of things. A great set of pliers um, that you're going to use a lot. Last one is side cutting pliers, also called side cuts um, for cutting uh, wire, cutting, you know, steel cable, that kind of stuff. Um, really nice groove jaws. You can see what they're talking about. That's the groove. I'm sorry, curved handles, lap joints, and diagonal cutting jaws. Um, you can see they're kind of kind of a uh, kind of a specialty tool, though. You really don't use them for anything else. You don't use them to hold anything. They're really just for cutting stuff. Um, you can use them to strip back some wire insulation if you're careful, um, but that is something that you got to use at your own risk because a little too much effort, a little too much force, you're gonna cut the wire off and you're gonna have to start back over. So um, really, just use the cut wires. Uh, still a very useful tool. Now, the stuff that you just saw, all those green handle things, those are all part of a set, typically. And I do recommend that as you start getting in this, find yourself some nice tools, even if it's just in the beginning going to Harbor Freight and picking up some stuff. Start getting yourself some pliers. All the stuff that we're talking about, um, you can get a kit for these about $100 to $200. But yeah, $200 bucks sounds like a lot. Um, but having some tools at home is, is, man, it's useful. And, you know, you think about right now, being at home a lot, it's a good time to have some tools. All right, hammers. Now I will say, um, as we get into this, I did not bring all the hammers home with me. So I only grabbed the hammers that I'm gonna probably use, um, but I will talk about the other one. First one is a ball peen hammer. This is what I didn't grab um, because honestly, unless you're doing something very specific, um, you know, shaping some metal, doing some other things, you don't need it. You can do everything that you can with a claw hammer. Uh, but typically it has two rounded sides. So you can see in the picture, uh, kind of point to here and point to here, uh, you, you can, you can shape some metal. These are also nice because you can you can um, use this to, to work on some of the bolts. Something you got to hit a little bit harder if you're doing some metal fabrication. We will use these a lot if you guys move into Auto Tech One, uh, doing a lot of stuff with the carts. Um, but in automotive industry, I actually don't use this very often. I'm going to use the next hammer quite a bit more. That is a dead blow or a rubber mallet. Um, this this one actually is filled with with sand, um, but it says usually hollow head filled with sand or shot to reduce rebound. So when you hit something, it's not going to have that big rebound. And it's not like a, if you ever actually use like a full on rubber mallet, you hit it and you feel like you didn't do anything to what you hit and it just bounces back five feet. Um, what's nice about these is that kind of takes up that and they can add more weight in here. And so that actually can give you a little bit more power. Now the heads of these do get beat up, but that's the point of it. This is not necessarily a consumable, but it's something that this gets damaged, not your part. Uh, in the automotive industry, that's really important. Um, we're not going to be hitting bolts because you can damage the threads. We're not going to be trying to knock something loose with a metal hammer on metal. Um, so there's some other options in there. You know, we can have some lead hammers, some brass hammers, that kind of stuff. But nowadays, with how good they've made dead blow hammers with the different plastics and materials, and even the different adjustable heads that you can buy, this is a pretty useful tool um, that's replaced pretty much all other hammers or mallets you may need in your toolbox. Next one, I always bring this up because people always... They reach for a claw hammer because I think it's the hammer you know. This has really nothing to do with automotive. Um, this, is, this is a woodworking. So this is for construction. So that's to drive a nail. That's to extract a nail. Yes, we have a couple of these in the shop because we do some things with wood. Um, but we're not going to use them on a car. Um, unless you're like wailing away on something that you're hitting a piece of a wood to break something else loose. Now we've got other tools and hammers to use instead of that. But still want to talk about it because, you know, like I said, you may not go in automotive and you may be a carpenter and you're like, you've never heard of a claw hammer. You just called this a hammer. So that's what it is, a claw hammer. So on to the next one, drivers. So screwdrivers, um, one of the things that I always kind of tell my students is screwdriver is a screwdriver. It means it's meant to drive screws or a screw head style fastener. It is not a pry bar. It is not a wedge. It's not designed for that. There's a lot of tools we're not going to talk about today. Um, but the purpose of a tool, it really is designed for a specific intention. Uh, and so as we talk about these tools, use them as they're intended. That's probably the number one thing I can stress to you as you start using tools. Don't try to use it outside of the realm it was designed for. That's how you're going to snap a screwdriver. That's how you're going to hurt something, break something, hurt yourself, hurt somebody else. Uh, so very, very important. First thing is a nut driver used to drive cap screws and small bolts. Uh, automotive, these are very popular. So this one right here is available um, in standard or metric. 
and it's a fixed size, meaning that it only has one size. I can't detach that. So this one right here is a one fourth inch, which is a really popular size quarter inch, and it's used to drive those. Now you can use it on a on a bolt that's quarter inch size. Uh, it may not have enough force to really break it loose, but you could actually use this to kind of loosen it up after you've broken it loose or tighten it down until you need to put on that little bit more torque. Now I, I do have another one here that is adjustable, meaning that there is your, your driver and then you can put it in different sizes. Now these are nice um, in that you can have one set here and you can have a ton of different adapters. Um, the, the thing that some people don't like about them is sometimes if you're like in a tight spot, that can get pulled out and now this is somewhere where you probably don't want it to be and now you gotta go spend time fishing that out. So if you ever dropped a bolt or um, dropped a, a socket or something like that as you're working on something, you know that struggle. So these are really good, uh, but not the best for getting into tight spaces and then coming back out. You gotta be real careful with that. So those are our nut drivers. Slotted or straight screwdriver. I've got two right here and actually, I'm going to show you guys something here as we're looking at these. So use mostly in woodworking applications. You always use the correct size. Um, woodworking is the most common because you don't have a lot of surface area to grab onto something. So typically what happens is when you're, you're tightening these down, um, you have a tendency to slip out or strip. Now wood, because it's a soft material, you can kind of drive that in pretty easily. Now with that, always use the correct size. Now you can see there's different sizes. They're actually numbered too. Um, we're not we're not getting that too much this video, but when we start working, hopefully next year, you guys will see that. But always use the correct size because if you don't, you can see here. I don't know if you can see how close. See how that's rounded? You can actually see that's broken. This is like screwdrivers. Man, it's probably not even two months old, and you can already see that it's starting to strip. Um, the reason is is that it probably wasn't intended for that size, or there's probably a lot of torque on it and kind of stripped it out. One thing that's really common to want to do is to stick this into things and pry it open. A screwdriver is very, very weak this way. Now, yeah, I'm not going to be able to snap it right now, but if I put this into something and I pry it up on it, it's going to crack or snap. That's why I use a specific pry bar or um, some different tools that are designed to kind of wedge themselves in there and pry open. Typically, they actually make this a square stock and then they widen this out and it has a lot more strength than your, your slotted screwdriver is going to have. One thing that we do actually see these used a lot for is our carburetors on our small gas engines, our go-karts, old, um, old, old school dialing in your distributor, because you got to turn just a little tiny adjustment knob, something that's not going to have a lot of force on it. But once again, slotted screwdrivers, something you're going to use quite a bit. You can see the different sizes as well. Next is a Phillips screwdriver. Phillips screwdriver, um, always use correct size. Become, they, they come in a number of sizes. Once again, just like on slotted, they also come in different lengths. Um, guess you just got to make sure you're using the right one. When you put this into the head of a, of a Phillips screw, you want to make sure that it seats really well and it doesn't have a lot of wiggle room. If it's got a lot of wiggle room, go up a size. Um, you also notice that sometimes the points are different. Sometimes they're rounded, so you can see a little bit more rounding on, excuse me, on that one uh, versus the other one. What's nice about some of these two is they also come magnetic, which means they're going to hold on to that screw a little bit easier, which makes guiding it down into a a, a tight space or even just kind of pulling it back out if you didn't get it right. So Phillips screwdrivers, hopefully a lot of this stuff has been kind of common to you. Uh, we might start getting into some stuff you don't know. So you guys can see in this picture, uh, I've got a bunch of different wrenches and yes, these all fall into kind of the wrench family. Um, and you look up there, hopefully you're like looking at those and like, oh, I, I, I've used all these. I don't know all the names. Um, some of you may be like, I haven't used half of those or none of those. Uh, but this is really now getting to automotive. What we just talked about was pretty generic to everything. But automotive is really going to be used uh, a lot of wrenches. So let's get into the first one here, which is a box-in wrench. Now, I've got a kind of a, this is called an obtuse box-in. Now, this doesn't look exactly like the picture, but it, it does have two box-ins. Now, you may say, why is it called a box-in? I don't really have a good answer to that. Uh, box in basically think closed in meaning that it's all the way closed around um, these are available in six or 12 point meaning that there's either 12 points in here or six points in here they're usually matched but sometimes they are different on this one this is two different sizes so you have on one side half inch and on the other side seven sixteenths 
that's kind of nice. So each wrench actually gives you two sizes. So if you're right in between and you're like, oh, I can't tell, I'll go grab the one that has both sizes on there and you can start working on it. Why do you use a box end wrench? Main reason is, is that it gives you those, all those sides of contact. When you have an option to put a closed end or a box end wrench on a bolt, I recommend it because you're having more surface area, which means you're not as prone to strip a bolt. Very, very important to know that. As we start getting into to actually work on stuff, uh, stripping a bolt is super, super common. And the way that that usually happens is you're doing an open-ended wrench, it's not the right size, and you put way too much force on it. And next thing you know, you've rounded the head of that bolt, and now we're spending 15, 20, an hour uh, trying to extract that bolt. And that, that's what no one wants. No one wants to spend their time doing that. Everyone wants to actually be taking some apart work and fixing something, especially if you're actually getting paid for it. So a box and wrench, um, once again, don't know the reason why that title is. If you know and you can find an awesome reason why, share it with me. Uh, that way I can uh, share that on with all the rest of my students. Maybe I'll throw in some extra credit for you. So box and wrench. Next is open in it. So the opposite there, both sides are open. Now, why, are, why do we use these? Well, it's not always possible to get all the way around a bolt. So you may not be able to get on there. Um, so this is going to be able to get you in there, loosen, tighten, whatever you need to do, and then back out. Both ends are open and they are two different sizes. That way, if you're, like I said, you're close to a size, you can go ahead and get what size you need or be close to it. That way you're not running back and forth to your toolbox. Now, one thing that's been saying up there uh, on a lot of these is available in standard or metric sizes. That's pretty much given with tools. Um, what you'll see here is standard is sometimes called SAE, and then you have metric sizes. So standard is inches. So we're talking about in half inch, seven sixteenths, three eighths. You know, we're talking about the fractions of an inch. Metric sizes, you're talking about a 10 mil, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Um, so you're talking about metric and standard. So I'm not going to probably mention that again, even though it's going to be on a lot of the slides. So open-ended wrench. Combination wrench, this is what most sets are. They're going to be box end, open end, forms a combo. Now these are both the same size. So this one I have here is an 18 millimeter. So 18 millimeter, if I were to like ask you exactly what this tool was, you tell me it's an 18 millimeter combination wrench and it is 12 point. It means there's 12 points around here. Pretty simple. Basically a combination of the two things you just saw. Next is a tubing and flare nut wrench. This is something that if you get into any type of um, plumbing system, so we're talking brakes, we're talking um, fuel lines, fuel fittings, we're talking about um, sometimes even our HVAC, if you have any small fittings that go into there, your ABS modules covered with these as all the brake lines come into it. And the reason this is better than a, um, open in it is it gives you those points of contact, but you still have to be able to slide over the tube and go in there. Some people ask, why do they not use these for all of them? Well, they really don't work for anything other than tubing because you can't get in there. You can't get over the bolt. So it doesn't really help. Now, there is times when this is beneficial, um, when you can't get in a, um, a box in and you could get one of these in. That does happen, but primarily this is used for those plumbing applications to ensure fittings are not stripped. Do not want to strip a brake line. You do not want to strip a fuel line. You're going to be replacing a lot of stuff. And all it was was grabbing the right tool to do the job. So flare or uh, flare nut or tubing wrench. These ones do have different sizes on each end. So just a common thing there, uh, common design in those. So next up is an adjustable wrench. I actually, ah, it's like a love hate with these. Um, you you, you got to have them, but you really should never use them because they are, this is how you strip everything. <laughs> I, I don't know. Got this little adjuster wheel here, adjustable for wide sizes, available in applications with a variety of faster sizes. If you got a toolbox and you have some combo open in and box and wrenches, use those. Don't use these. In fact, um, typically when we would have done the small gas engines this semester, I actually take all these out of the toolboxes and out of the tool um, crib because I don't want you using them. They're a crutch. Go get the right tool. Start learning sizes. You should be able to start looking at a bolt head and like, that's a 7 16 That's a 3 8 That's a half inch. You don't need this. Um, this is good. Still a useful tool. Um, actually, I find this most useful when a bolt has started to strip and no longer it fits in between sizes. 
uh, or you got a rusted bolt that started to pit and started to break away. But you got to have them, but uh, don't use them. That's kind of my, my big thing on those. Uh, they loosen up over time. And so when they loosen up over time, you may not notice it. Next thing you know, you're, you've done two bolts and you're going on the next one and you've rounded it. And you can't really go back from rounding a bolt. So, um, yeah, so adjustable wrench right there. All right, most important thing in this lesson uh, is understanding drive size. And people are like, what, is, what do you mean drive size? You're probably going to know what I'm talking about here in a second. But you need to understand, I'm kind of just pausing for a second, understanding that this, this not only allows you to be organized, but also allows you to understand um, how you're going to buy tools. So it's like if you went to the hardware store and you walked down the aisle of all the nuts and bolts and you're like, I don't know what I need. I don't know what I'm supposed to be getting. Um, I just know I need this size. Well, that size could be multiple different threads. It could be different materials could be a different grade of bolt that's kind of the same thing here of dry size so i'm going to jump in here i'm going to grab my three ratchets that are the most common sizes so drive size determines what socket we use to match the ratchet so sizes are one fourth quarter three eighths half inch and you can kind of see as i hold them up here you can see the different sizes and hopefully that starts to make some sense to you like okay I've seen that. I've seen a small one. I've seen a big one. And I just, maybe I saw the middle one, but never realized that how they kind of all stack up. But what we're talking about, I'm going to kind of zoom in here. I got the arrow, but even then, drive size is this. And that's physically what size from side to side that is. So what size is that? And that's going to determine what socket slides over it. Can't put the wrong size on a socket. You can force it all day long. It's not going to go there. Now, one thing else about sockets or drive sizes that is important to understand is that size also determines the kind of the strength of that bolt. It's going to determine um, what the application is. You're not going to break head studs loose with this little tiny quarter inch. You're going to use a larger size ratchet. Now, you may not, probably not even use a ratchet. You're probably going to use a breaker bar, but you're going to use a half-inch breaker bar, not a one-fourth inch breaker bar. Yes, they do make one-fourth inch breaker bars. So... Hopefully that starts to make some sense. Now we're going to go in and spend a lot more time going through drive sizes as we talk about each tool within this. So first is your ratcheting wrench. I'm going to grab the big one just so it's easier to see the detail. So this is your half inch. On here, uh, ratcheting wrench is also called a ratchet. Uh, once you can see here, it's available in those, those three common sizes and also available in three-fourths, actually also available in inch. But those things are massive. You're not going to be getting that in your hardware store. That's a special order thing um, for large-scale construction. The reversible direction, so you can change which way this actually ratchets. You can hear why it's called a ratcheting wrench. And you can go the other way, and it ratchets that way. The other thing it has on here is it has this little button. And let's see if I can find the right size there. And you can see, see how that protrudes out of the bottom? What that does is it actually pushes the socket off. Let me grab a socket here. So I can put that on, push that in. Now if I, let, I hit the button, it drops off. So that's a really nice feature. Some of them don't have that. You just gotta kind of snap it on. Um, but that one does have that feature, which is pretty nice. On there, you guys can see right above my picture, it says not for breaking loose extremely tight bolts. That ratcheting mechanism, as strong as it is, even on a half inch, if you put a lot of torque on it, you're gonna snap that ratcheting mechanism inside of here. Um, now, different ones, you sometimes will hear like, where they click a lot more, or sometimes it only has a couple clicks. Different ratchets can have different designs in here of less or more teeth to give either more strength or more precision. So they kind of go one way or the other. You can't have really both unless you're um, kind of right in the middle with very high end materials. But most of them are going to have just kind of a coarse ratchet. So it gives it some strength. But it's not very fine or precise. So that's your ratcheting wrench. It's again, it comes in those different sizes. And we'll talk more about those as we go. All right. So a breaker bar. Available in all those sizes we've talked about. And this is used to apply much larger torque on fasteners than a ratchet. You can just see, I gotta, look how far I gotta zoom back here to actually show you. Now this is a half inch. Now they do make bigger ones than this, but this is a pretty common um, breaker bar. It's called a breaker bar for a reason. It's meant to break bolts loose. It's not for tightening bolts. Cannot stress that enough. If you come in here and you start tightening down, say like your spark plug with a breaker bar, you don't have a lot of control because even that little bit of movement is a lot of torque a lot of twists down here. And that's how you're going to strip something. That's how you're going to break ahead of something off. 
So not for tightening bolts, only used for breaking them loose. Speed wrench. Speed wrenches are really nice. They're used to rapidly remove a nut or bolt. So if you've got something broken loose and it's got some long engagement, head bolts are one of the most common things these are used for. You can really start going fast on them. If you have something actually holding down here, you can start actually one hand and spin it, which is kind of cool. So you can really get going pretty fast on those. They come in all the different sizes, but it really it's, it's a speed wrench. The name implies that it's meant to remove something quickly. This one actually has a, um, a handle that's a floating handle. Can't come off, but it's floating, so your hand doesn't have to move. Some of them are fixed. Those ones kind of stink. I don't really like those ones, um, but this one's kind of nice. This one also has a pivoting head on it, so you can actually kind of come in here and beat at some, some interesting angles with that, which is kind of cool. So right there, speed wrench. All right, next up is a six-point socket. <clears throat> Oof, probably the most infuriating thing is what we'll go over in the next couple slides. Know your sockets, know where they go, and put them back where you got them. In your own toolbox, if you've got to open up a drawer and you've got 100 different sockets and they're all out of place, that's your toolbox. But in our shop, that's not going to happen. Um, very, very important that you put them back where you got them. If you don't know, ask me or whoever your instructor is, where does this go? Please do not just randomly put it somewhere because now I'm going to spend a ton of time looking for it. Learn your tools. Learn the sockets. So we're going to go over a few things. When we talk about a socket, we want to know four different unique pieces of information. First is going to be the easiest one because you can count it. That is, how many points does it have? This one has six points. I can literally count six points. Next thing I'm going to know, what drive size is it? You may look at that and have absolutely no idea. Out of context and before you really start learning tools, you probably won't know. Is that a half inch? Is that one fourth? It's three eighths. This one is three eighths. So the second thing we need to know is what the drive size is. Third thing I want to know is, is it standard or deep well? Standard or deep well? So standard means it's short. So S for short. Deep well, deep. Got one right here. Deep well, it's deeper, deeper. The last thing is, is if there's anything special about the socket. Now, that may mean it's an impact socket. So it may be made out of a different material. Impact sockets are going to give you a lot more torque. It's going to give you something that's going to really be able to hit a hard bolt, especially with an impact gun. Maybe it's a spark plug socket, and it has insulation inside of here and allows you to do something different. So there's different specialty sockets that go along with it. So four pieces of information I want. What points, drive size, standard deep well, and is there anything special about the socket? Now, you can tell me, just print it on it, what size it is. Now, I didn't say that's one of the four pieces of information because that should be a given. It's written on the socket. You don't have to guess on that. I mean, six point, you have to count. I mean, this you just have to be able to read. So there's really no reason why I can't mess that up. So this one right here, I've got a 14 millimeter, six point standard socket. Nothing special about it. So I wouldn't put any identifiers on there. Right there. So cool. Moving on to our next one. Eight point. Uh, it has eight points and is used on square nuts found on farm machinery. On our small gas engines, the only thing that's eight point is your, um, your drain plug. It's actually four point, but an eight point is the only one that'll work. This is found on farm machinery. This is, you gotta think our engines were tiller engines. So they actually were designed for agricultural use. That's why they still have some eight point sockets. Now we've actually converted all of them over to six point or 12 point. Um, but on the off chance I've missed one or someone else has missed one over the years, uh, you may have to use an eight-point socket on it. Not really use that often very, or very common anymore. It looks like a star, but you guys can see that square that's kind of embedded in there. Uh, but still a popular socket um, for some agricultural purposes. 12-point 12 12 point socket. Now, I didn't talk too much about a six-point, but the reason is the 12-point slide does a much better job covering this. It has thin walls to fit in tight spaces. If I grabbed a 12-point and a six-point of the same size, you would see the, the thickness of the sides is much thicker on a 12 point. Now that's gonna give you more strength, but it doesn't give you as much clearance to fit around things. So it provides less contact on the nut and bolt. And you may think it has more, more points, shouldn't that provide more contact? No, it actually provides less because it's breaking up that, that contact that a six point has. 
um, into more points. So that way you can fit it in tighter areas. And it doesn't mean you don't have to turn it so many degrees until you find it fit on the next size. You can just turn it basically half the amount and fit it on there. So it gives you quite a bit of ease to fit something in there. That is your 12 point. So just kind of beating in your heads a little bit more. I would say this is, when I'm identifying it, this is a 15 sixteenths, 12 point, half inch drive, standard socket. Nothing special about it. Don't have to put any identifiers on there. All right, next one. Deep well socket. Deep well, similar to a 12 point, it's designed to fit into tighter spaces. It says it has thin walls to fit in tight spaces. That's primarily true, but you will find some deep wells that are very thick outside walls, um, impacts that are deep well or that way. The extra depth allows contact with recessed bolts and nuts. So if you have a really long recessed bolt and the nut's really low, or you're taking a nut off of a long carrier bolt, that's what a deep well will be used for. Comes in all the sizes that everything else has, um, but I'm gonna identify this socket. It is a 5 8 six point deep well socket. It is nothing else about it. That's all I need to say. Unless I missed something, which I might have. All right, on to the next one, a swivel socket. Now we identify these a little bit differently. Still have a lot of the same information. This is where we're gonna get into something special. So here, this has the socket built in. Some people are like, oh, it's a U-joint, it's a universal joint. It's actually not, it has a U-joint, but it also has a socket built into it. The reason we like these is that a U-joint, once you have the socket on there, it's a lot taller. This one right here, because you can actually cast in the, um, the socket, it actually allows it to be a lot shorter, and that way you have a lot less area taken up. So that's kind of nice, but that means you have to buy a whole set of these to have all the sockets versus a U-joint, which you can just simply put on whatever sockets you already have, but it's a little bit longer. So if I'm going to identify this one, this is a 5 8 12-point swivel socket. Now you might have, so I would say, I'm sorry, standard, you may have a deep well swivel socket. Not very common, but they are out there. And this one is a half inch drive. So swivel socket, not to be confused with a U-joint. U-joint looks exactly like it, except they don't have a socket. And basically it takes, you put your ratchet or your extension on there, you need to put your socket on there, and it allows you that flexibility and motion um, to reach those long, those locations that are difficult or the angles may be difficult. Very, very common when you're working under the hood that you don't have a straight shot at something. U joints are going to probably be uh, one of your best friends. You may have to use two U joints. You know, got to get around something. Now, the more extreme angles you put in something, the harder it is to keep leverage on it, the harder it is to keep something on there. Um, so you want to try to make it so you don't have as, so much of a bend at it. Um, just the minimum amount is what you're looking for. Socket adapter. Now you may want to take a socket and adapt it to a different size. So say you have a 3 8 inch socket, but you have tons of half inch or quarter inch adapters, um, extensions and all this kind of stuff. Well, maybe you need one of these to adapt to that size. Or maybe you need a little bit more leverage on a small bolt. So maybe you're over here on your quarter inch and uh, just a, it's, you're putting so much force trying to, trying to loosen this up and like, okay, well, I'm gonna use all the same tools I just had, but I'm gonna switch out my wrench. I just had my adapter. Now I've got more leverage. I can break it free easier and I'm on to the next thing. So thinking smarter, not harder. Socket adapter is commonly called an adapter um, and they've got all different kinds of sizes. So you can go always just one size at a time. You're not gonna see some from one fourth to half inch. Always gonna just be one step. So half inch, three eighths, three eighths half inch because you can go up or down and then one fourth to three eighths and three eighths to one fourth. Next is an extension bar. Basically an extension is just a way to extend your ratchet. So it connects to the socket, wrench the handle to give workspace clearance and they come in sizes of about three inches, which this one is all the way up to 20 inches. I have seen some longer ones, especially ones. You can also combine them. So you can take your three and your six and your, your 12 and your 20 and now you have a ton. Now I will say every time you add one, it's giving you another point where it's kind of flexing and moving on you. So you gotta be careful not to add too many. All right, on to measuring tools. 
I don't know where I'm at time-wise, but I would imagine we're probably at a point where we'll, we'll break this up and move on to the next one. Um, and that, that's a good spot because measuring tools and specialty tools will come next. So um, we'll, we'll say that's the end for this one and uh, we'll move on to the next one, which I'm just going to keep filming. So we'll see you on the next one.